Hi, I'm Iva Kucherenko, we're United24 Media, and here's the latest news from Ukraine. Protecting the sky over Ukraine, French President Emmanuel Macron has announced that France will transfer Mirage 2000 combat aircraft to Ukraine. In the interview for French television, he also highlighted that a six-month training course for Ukrainian pilots will start this summer. We are going to launch a new cooperation and announce the delivery of Mirage 2005, which are French combat aircraft, which will allow Ukraine to protect its soil, its airspace. And so, starting tomorrow, we are going to launch a program to train pilots and transfer these planes. Macron added that the country will train additional Ukrainian military personnel as a part of new cooperation between France and Ukraine. Today he met with Ukrainian counterpart Volodymyr Zelensky. We have decided that France will fully equip and train the personnel of a full brigade as a part of the efforts to regenerate the Ukrainian forces. We are talking about training four and a half thousand soldiers. Among other things, we agreed to open an office in Ukraine for KNDS, a French company with which we will produce 155 caliber artillery ammunition in Ukraine. Ukraine has already used U.S. weapons to strike inside Russia in recent days, reports the Associated Press. The journalists are citing a U.S. senator and Western officials. According to the Institute for the Study of War, Ukraine may have used the HIMARS to hit the S-300 and S-400 systems from which Russia fired at Kharkiv 50 kilometers from the Ukrainian border on June 2nd. Ukraine is not allowed to use U.S.-made weapons to strike deep into Russia, said the U.S. President Joe Biden. During an interview for the ABC News, he explained in which circumstances Ukraine can use weapons for striking military targets in Russia. We're not talking about giving them weapons to strike Moscow, to strike the Kremlin, to strike in just across the border where they're receiving significant fire from conventional weapons used by the Russians to go into Ukraine to kill the Ukrainians. The Moscow Times reports that Russian self-proclaimed President Vladimir Putin wears a bulletproof vest to public events. According to their sources, this was on recommendation of the Federal Security Service back in 2023. However, the representative of Defense Intelligence of Ukraine, Andriy Yusuf, while answering a question about Putin's body armor, stated that the Kremlin leader had done so for the last five years. Ukraine may use Western weapons against Russian border strikes, said Chancellor Olaf Scholz. In front of the German parliament, he stated that Ukraine has the right under international law to defend itself against attacks on its territory, its cities and its citizens. This also applies to attacks such as those in Kharkiv area, which Russia carries out from positions in the directly neighboring Russian border area. Ukraine can also use the weapons supplied by us and our allies to defend itself against such attacks. Earlier, German Minister of Defense Boris Pistorius said that he wanted to strengthen the operational readiness of the Bundeswehr. Finances, equipment and personnel are the key elements to improve on. We must be ready for war by 2029. We must act as a deterrent to prevent the worst from happening. Doretsk, close to the front line in the Donetsk region, is one of the cities that has been under Russian attacks for the last 10 years. Before the full-scale invasion, the community was home to nearly 70,000 inhabitants. Now this number is almost seven times less. Our colleague Philip Malzan visited Toretsk. Here's his story about the city and its defenders. Today we are reporting from Toretsk, which used to be a thriving mining town in eastern Ukraine, but has now been effectively a frontline city for almost 10 years. And that's the really interesting thing about this place, that it's the only section of the front line that basically hasn't moved even after the start of the full-scale evasion in February 2022. We drive through the city lying in ruins, its inhabitants living for over a decade in this void, somewhere between war and peace, life and death. In February 2022, the units that were here on duty put in great effort to stop the enemy, and now we are continuing their work and getting better. Also, positions were first built here from 2014 to 2015, and all this time they are being improved. This makes it difficult for the enemy to advance in this area. Also, the terrain makes it difficult for them to advance and organize quick breakthroughs. Russian attacks on Kharkiv tripled in May. In one month alone, the second largest city in Ukraine was attacked by 37 aerial bombs, 25 missile strikes and numerous drones. 
This marks a significant escalation when compared with April, says city mayor Igor Terehov. On Telegram, he reported that there were 193 air raid sirens totaling 474 hours of alerts, the equivalent of 20 non-stop days. Russian forces have established a filtration camp in the Russian-controlled part of Ovchansk, while the town itself is being destroyed by shelling and rendered uninhabitable, said the head of the Kharkiv Regional Military Administration, Oleg Sinehubov. Ovchansk is currently divided into three parts, occupied, a so-called gray zone, and the one under control of Ukrainian armed forces. According to Senehubov, although few people remain in the occupied part of the city, Russians use them as a human shield. Meanwhile, up to 50 residents are still in the part of Vovchansk controlled by the armed forces of Ukraine. Despite heavy fights and constant shelling by Russian forces, the military and police continue evacuation. Russian oil depots in two regions were under Ukrainian drone attack. Yesterday, a Ukrainian drone hit an oil depot in Stary Oskol, reported Russia's Belgorod region governor. At the same time, loud explosions were also heard in the Nova Shakhtinsk refinery in Russia's Rostov region. According to the U.S. president, the risk of a conflict with Russia will only increase if Ukraine isn't supported by its allies. In an interview with Time, Joe Biden urged for Ukraine not to be left abandoned in its war against Russia, as he believes such a scenario would lead to destabilization in the region. He also stated that securing peace in Ukraine is crucial to prevent further Russian occupation. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and the First Lady arrived in France yesterday to take part in the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of the Allied landings in Normandy. Also known as D-Day, it was a key event in the Second World War. On the 6th of June 1944, Allied forces landed on the Normandy coast in Nazi-occupied France. This allowed them to launch a large-scale offensive in Western Europe. The ceremony was attended by leaders from a number of countries. U.S. President Joe Biden also arrived in France for the ceremony. During his visit, he held a meeting with Volodymyr Zelensky. The United States will provide Ukraine with a new military aid package worth approximately $225 million that was announced by the U.S. president. Because uh, we had trouble getting the a bill that we had to pass, that had the money in it, from some of our very conservative members who were holding it up. But we got it done finally. and. Uh, since then, including today, I've announced six packages of significant funding. Today I'm also signing an additional package. The new aid includes ammunition for the high marks, crucial for defending Kharkiv from the ongoing Russian assault, mortar systems and various artillery rounds. Now to some refreshingly good news. A 98-year-old refugee finds a new home. The story of Lydia, a resident of the partially occupied village of Cheritiana in the Donetsk region, went viral in April. She had to walk under fire for approximately 10 kilometers to reach Ukrainian-controlled territory. The regional police have shared her story. I woke up and they were shooting. It was terrible. I survived that war, I survived this war, and I'm left with nothing. Lydia has a new home now. Ole Horokhovsky, the co-founder of Ukraine's largest online bank, purchased a new house for her as a gesture of support and admiration for her courage and resilience. Announcing the gift, he asserts that Lydia will undoubtedly live in her new house long enough to witness the day when this terror will end. The United Kingdom and Latvia launched an industry competition to provide thousands of drones for Ukraine. The drones will be procured as part of the Drone Capability Coalition for Ukraine, co-led by these two countries. The British Ministry of Defense highlighted the effectiveness of first-person view drones on the battlefield since Russia's full-scale invasion. They are providing Ukrainian operators with situational awareness to target enemy positions, armored vehicles and ships, using explosive munitions mounted to the FPVs. Almost 50 drones and five missiles were shot down over Ukraine last night, reported the commander of the Ukrainian Air Forces. According to him, Russia intended to target the critical infrastructure facilities in nine Ukrainian regions. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development intends to mobilize additional funding of more than 300 million euros for Ukraine's energy companies. This will support the restoration of power facilities and infrastructure and ensure a stable, uninterrupted electricity supply across the country. This agreement was signed between the EBRD director and Ukrainian prime minister. Meanwhile, the Financial Times reports that due to renewed Russian shelling of Ukraine's energy infrastructure, residents of the country are likely to face prolonged electricity outages by winter. The latest Russian strikes have focused on thermal and hydroelectric power plants, which are more difficult and expensive to rebuild. 
The U.S. is working together with European countries to use frozen Russian assets to benefit Ukraine, said State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller. Senior U.S. Treasury officials are finding ways to provide larger amounts of urgently needed funds to Ukraine by tapping the value of profits earned on frozen Russian assets. The vast majority of the frozen Russian assets are not held in the United States. They're held in European countries. So uh, for the, this action to be as effective as possible, it's important that we act in concert with our allies, and we are in consultation with uh, our European allies about the best way to do that possible. But we are committed to ensuring that um, Russian frozen assets um, remain immobilized and that they're put to use for the benefit of the Ukrainian people. One year after Russia destroyed the dam of the Kohovka hydroelectric power plant, Ukraine and the UN estimate damages at $14 billion. On June 6, 2023, a torrent of water discharged from the Kohovka reservoir, flooding the banks of the Dnipro River. In just a few hours, the water level had risen by several meters, flooding Kherson and the villages dotted along the river. This footage went viral one year ago. It shows what the Kherson region looked like after Russian forces destroyed the Kahovka hydroelectric power station dam. The attack took place at 3 o'clock in the morning on the 6th of June. In light of developments on the battlefield, Russia's deliberate and long-planned terrorist act turned the man-made flood into a weapon. The harm to the environment is of particular concern. At first, the Russians tried to lay the blame on Ukrainian forces, accusing them of shelling the dam and causing its partial destruction. However, there had been no shelling into the night, reported local residents. At that time, the Kohovka hydroelectric power plant and the dam had been under Russian control for more than one year. It is physically impossible to blow it up from the outside by shelling. It was mined. It was mined by the Russian occupiers. They blew it up. Around 80 settlements in Ukraine, not only in the Kherson region, but also in the Mykolaiv region, came under threat of flooding. Houses and fields were submerged. Thousands of people were evacuated. While these evacuations took place, Russian forces continued to shell Ukrainian territories, especially Kherson. Russia cannot defeat us on the battlefield. So, it targets civilian infrastructure to try to freeze us into submission. Russians also didn't allow Ukrainians to rescue the people in the temporarily occupied territories. Often, the only help the Ukrainian military could provide was the provision of drinking water delivered by drones. Here is an account from Oleshki. Oleshki was one of the Russian occupied villages. Six months after the disaster, Associated Press journalists published the results of their own investigation. At the time of the flood, Oleshki had about 16,000 residents. The number of residents killed ran into the hundreds. The investigators talked to a dozen people, including medical workers who kept records of the dead and a volunteer who was involved in the burials. The Russians, on the other hand, stated that only 59 people died in the floods in Russian-controlled territories. Putin did not hesitate to employ hunger as a weapon, energy as a weapon. He, win he weaponized the winter. He is playing a nuclear gamble with nuclear power plants in Ukraine. So this is, again, new escalation, new sign of escalation. The destruction of the dam killed 33 people and injured 28 on the territory controlled by Ukraine. 40 more are still missing a year after the disaster. The safety of the temporarily occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is also under threat. The dam's reservoir provided essential cooling for all six reactors in Europe's largest nuclear power station. To seek damages for Russia's destruction of the Kohovka Dam and power station, Ukraine has initiated the process of international arbitration. Ukraine's state-run hydropower generating company has estimated its damages at almost $3 billion. We started working here when the Kohovka reservoir was still full. We noticed the difference. This is the crew commander of the Leleka UAV with the call sign Milan. On the screen is what used to be the Kahovka Reservoir, before the Russians destroyed the dam of the Kahovka hydroelectric power station. According to local fishermen, if you step in certain places, you can fall through just like quicksand. I have heard such stories, but in general, I think it's impossible to move around there. 
If it were possible, Milan says, enemy subversive and reconnaissance group would probably make attempts to cross this territory. However, Russians are still on the other side. The task for now is to inspect the front edge of Russian positions for additional destruction. Something is camouflaged. There, there's something down there. Great, we did it. Let's get ready. The Russians are trying to shoot back. It's right next to us. Right across the street. But it's in vain. We offended the Russians. What can we do? They are always offended by us. And this is the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, occupied by Russians. NPP used water from the Kahovka reservoir to recharge the cooling pond. Now it is used by Russians as a front line of defense. There are engineering fortifications dug around the cooler pond and firing positions. From this place, they strike at the Marhanyats and Nikopol communities using the Parisian nuclear power plant as a shield. The equipment, armored vehicles and personnel are often located on the territory of the power plant itself, right next to the power units. Russians realize that Ukrainian troops will not strike back because of the nuclear power plant. We will not shoot there because it would be reckless to attack the power units of the nuclear power plant. However, in destroying the dam and the Kahovka reservoir, the Russians created problems for themselves, first and foremost. In addition to the fact that they would have to cross the Dnipro twice because of the two branches of the Dnipro, they would have to walk almost eight kilometers through the mud, which is unrealistic. They would be like targets in a shooting range. Ukraine is searching for more than 19,000 Ukrainian children, forcibly taken by Russia. These are only the cases where names have been confirmed, said First Lady Olena Zelenska. However, Russia continues to conceal the information and whereabouts of Ukrainian children, denying access to Ukrainian authorities and international organizations. So far, a little over 380 Ukrainian children have been returned to Ukraine. And these are always some kind of special operations when international organizations like UNICEF are involved. The frightening figure is that according to the Russians, almost 47,000 Ukrainian children have been transferred to Russian citizenship. Since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion, more than 500 children have been killed and almost 1,500 injured. On June 4th, Ukraine commemorated all the children who became victims to this brutal Russian war. In another successful operation by the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine in the Black Sea, a special unit destroyed the Russian Saturn tugboat. The operation occurred in Pansky Lake, with the Ukrainians reaching the location following a breakthrough of the Russian defensive barriers in the Black Sea. That's it for today. We're United24 Media. Thanks for being with us and see you next week.